Often when you go on a vacation or you're going on a road trip, you like to have a plan, a road map that tells you exactly where you're going. It might not be super detailed. You might not need to know that at 11 a.m. we're going to stop at this gas station and at 12.15 we're going to stop at this restaurant, but you have a general idea of where you want to go and that road map provides you with the way of how you're going to get there. So when we're doing a research study, we also use roadmaps. They're called a study framework. There are different types, but before we get into that, we need to understand some general vocabulary. So basically, a phenomenon of interest is something that we've noticed through our experiences as a nurse. Okay, we use a big word, phenomenon, but basically it's just something we see happening. And we might want to know why is this happening? You know, why do we notice this particular thing happening over and over in our workplace? Part of the phenomenon, a smaller component, is called a concept. That's whatever word we choose to describe the phenomenon that we see. Okay, it's typically abstract. So if I tell you this particular word and you have no idea what it means unless I explain it to you. So here's an example. A phenomenon that many of us have seen is that new grads, after they've graduated from nursing school, they struggle to integrate into the healthcare environment as, as soon as they graduate. It takes them a little time to get their feet wet and to figure out exactly what's going on. And there are several concept names that are used to describe that. Some people call that role transition stress, role socialization, um, sometimes reality shock. There's a bunch of different names that are all kind of used to describe the same phenomenon, the same thing that we see happening over and over in the workplace. Here's another example. You, I guarantee you've noticed this. Patients, especially if you work in the emergency room, you know that patients bottleneck in the emergency department. We have orders for admission, but we have no rooms to put them. The house supervisor is busy trying to find a place. We're backed up. So that concept, the name that describes that is called patient throughput. Okay, so phenomenon is something that we've experienced before. Concept is the words that we use to describe that. Okay, so now that we kind of understand what phenomenon concepts are, we can get into what a theory is. Now, please don't turn this off because a lot of people hear theory and they're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to learn about theory. That's so stupid. Like, what does this have to do with anything? But it does. It really does. And you're going to see by the end of this presentation. So again, phenomenon, something we've seen, something we've experienced. Concepts are the words that we use to describe what we've seen and what we've experienced. Now, if you take a couple of concepts and you link them together, then you have something called a proposition. It says that concept A is related to concept B in this way. So you can imagine that there's probably a bunch of things that could relate to that, such as high levels of patient um, through a poor patient throughput in the emergency department is related to poor patient satisfaction. Okay, that's two different concepts, patient satisfaction, patient throughput. We put those two concepts together and tell you that they are related. We've seen it, we know it. Okay, so then we take a bunch of pr um, propositions and we put them together into a theory. And all I want you to know is a theory is our attempt to explain some part of nursing. Why does that phenomenon happen the way it does? It's my way of trying to just say exactly why that's happening. Okay, so you can kind of think of it as a recipe, if you will. The concepts are the things in your ingredient list. So you might need parsley, you might need cumin, oregano. I just made something earlier, so I'm thinking of my recipe ingredients. And then your propositions are how you're going to combine the ingredients. So you're going to marinate your chicken, you're going to put your lime juice in there, you're going to put your cumin, your paprika, and you're going to put it in the refrigerator for 30 minutes and let it marinate. That's your proposition, how all those ingredients, concepts, are related together. And of course, as this slide says, you can cook without recipes. It's not a big deal. But a lot of times if you use a recipe, you're going to get a more um, uh, typical presentation. You're going to know exactly what you get. Your outcome is consistent. Okay, so that is talking about theories. The theory is the whole steps of the recipes put together to come up with this final recipe. Okay, so we're, we're talking about frameworks in this and how it, they design and serve as a roadmap for research studies. I promise we're getting there. So a model is just 
not quite the same thing as a theory. It does not have formal propositions, but they're still trying to explain phenomenon. They're just not quite as structured. They're loose. They, they might have some concepts here and there, but they don't say concept A is related to concept B and concept B is related to concept C. So they don't, it's not like that. It's just dealing with abstractions in a very loose, less rigid way than theories. So basically a framework serves as the skeleton of a study. Not every study is based on a theory or a conceptual model, but every single study you read about has a framework or a roadmap that tells them how they're going to do their study. It's either going to be based on a theory or a conceptual framework. So you have a theory, theoretical framework or conceptual framework. A conceptual framework is up here. It's just whatever I think is what I want to do, I'm going to do it because I don't have a theory to back it up. A theory, a theoretical framework is underpinned by a theory. So I have some examples. We're going to look at some other videos that tell you more about theories. Okay. Basically, I'm just kind of showing you the basic introduction. Um, so how are theories and conceptual models similar? They both are made up of concepts. They both require the researcher to define the concepts because when I say patient satisfaction, what does that mean to you? Is that talking about a specific score on an HCAT um, survey? Is that talking about their just general demeanor while they're in the, your department? You need to be specific. How, what does that word mean to you in this study? Um, and of course, they're developed inductively. They're based on the small little pieces of things that we see every day. Because I work in the emergency department and because patients are constantly bottlenecking in here, I know that this is a problem. So I take that and I build upon to explain why is this happening. Okay, that's called inductive reasoning. But and also how they are um, similar. This is important. They cannot be proven. Okay, we could do study after study after study, and they all support what my theory says, but that doesn't mean I've proven my theory. Okay, it just means I've supported it, but it's not necessarily proof of the theory being absolutely 100% right all the time. And where we're going with this is that all theories and conceptual models can help us generate hypotheses that we can turn into studies, and they can serve as a stimulus for research. So keep these things in mind. Basically, we can use a theory that exists out there and we can use it to help us make a roadmap of where we're going with our study. Okay, we can ask our research questions based on the theory. We can create our instruments based on the theory. Okay, so that's what a framework is. Now, this is a not the only video. If you just watch this video, you're going to be lost as a goose. So make sure you watch the other videos that give examples of theories that I'm talking about, because then you'll have a better idea of how researchers have used those to actually create their studies.